As you turn to 2 Peter chapter 3, uh, we think of all of the thefts in today's society, all the th car thefts in Ontario in particular in recent months, data theft with uh, millions of people in Ticketmaster getting their data stolen, property theft, bank theft, identity theft. People take great care to protect what they feel is valuable. But we know that there's a thief. His name is Satan. He's come to steal, kill, and destroy. He's come to take people captive to do his will as slaves of sin. But we also know that there's victory in Jesus, as the baptismal candidates testified last week. We're going to think about how God as, uh, can uh, enable us as believe, well, how, how can we can initially find victory and then how we can be protected through our own uh, diligence and careful walk with God to have victory over the thief. So our theme this morning is victory over the thief. I think of th this recent event in Haiti where three lives were quickly stolen from us, but not from God. They were martyrs, witnesses. The word martyr means witness. But Jude Martins and David and Natalie Lloyd, if we look at their picture there, they were snatched from planet Earth, but not from the Lord's presence as faithful uh, missionaries down in Haiti in recent years. And uh, uh, wild gangs, uh, as they were going out of a youth meeting, uh, took their lives, but they were martyrs for Christ. They knew the danger of being witnesses, but they were willing to lay down their lives for Christ. Now, we see in the life of Simon Peter a, a life that uh, was uh, willing to uh, be a martyr for Christ. Uh, Jesus told him after... Jesus' resurrection on the Sea of Galilee. Peter, when you were younger, you used to dress yourself and you used to go where you wanted to go. But when you are older, someone else will dress you and take you where you don't want to go. And Jesus said this, it's recorded in John chapter 21. Jesus said this to indicate the, the kind of death Peter would face as a martyr, just like these three, uh, and how he would glorify God. And then he said, Peter, do you love me? Uh, he said it three times. Peter's restored into fellowship. And Peter goes on, along with his wife, for the next 35 years with the view of martyrdom in mind. Now that's what we need to have in mind if we are witnesses for Christ. The word witness means martyr. And we need to have in our mind and focus the fact that we might someday have to lay down our lives even physically. But we lay down our lives daily. We take up our cross daily and be willing to die to self. And Peter and his wife were willing to do that. And for uh, 35 years in the regions of what's now Turkey and north of Turkey and east of Turkey, all the way from Babylon uh, to the east and Rome to the west, for 35 years they lived the life of willing martyrdom for Jesus. And uh, 500 towns and villages scattered over that area, Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, Bithynia, Jerusalem, Babylon, Rome, they were faithful witnesses and martyrs for Christ. They uh, lived for that which would last and which no thief could ever take from them. But as Peter comes to his final words, his martyrdom is right on the horizon. He was actually martyred under Nero in the same uh, approximate time as the Apostle Paul. Now you remember two weeks ago that excellent message by Steve Adams, leaving a lasting legacy as we looked at the Apostle Paul. Now Paul really messed up before he became a Christian, but he 
was able to say at the end of his life, I have fought the good fight, I have finished the faith, I have uh, finished the race, I have kept the faith. But you might ask yourself, well, what about if we, as believers, after we become a Christian, if we mess up? Well, that's where Peter comes in as we look at Peter this morning. Our failures don't have to be f f uh, final. Peter when Jesus said, all of you are going to betray me and, and fall, or, or, or fall away from me, Peter goes, not I, Lord. Yeah, I know how fickle all these other disciples are, but you can count on me. Peter, before the rooster crows twice to this very night, you're going to deny me three times. Peter denies the Lord three times. He goes out and weeps bitterly, but the Lord restores him. Uh, he, on the morning of Jesus' resurrection, go tell the disciples and Peter, just to remind Peter, yes, he's still my disciples, uh, my disciple. Uh, a while earlier, Jesus had warned Peter, and he'd warned all the disciples, Satan desires to sift you all as wheat, just like the thresher is sifting wheat and in a windy uh, setting, the, the chaff is blown away. The whole grain remains the same. And what Satan is saying to you sometimes is, you're not a real believer. You messed up the other day. Robert, you messed up the other day. You're not a real believer. And you're chaff. Satan, though, is what? He's a liar and a deceiver, and he wants to rob us of our joy, and he wants to rob us of our our, our secure position. Of course, he can't take that away of true believers, but he can make every effort to, to deceive us and to think that we uh, weren't Christians at all when we mess up. But when you look at the life of Peter and you trace from, right from the beginning of, of when Jesus first met him, Simon, son of John, I'm going to call you Peter, Rocky, Cephas in the Aramaic, uh, Aramaic. I, I know what I can make you, Peter. And so you, you see Peter's uh, fickleness, his, his pride, his arrogance. But now, 35 years later, as Peter's about to be martyred, he, he introduces himself as Peter, a servant and an apostle of Jesus Christ. Wonderful study to go. There's a book uh, I re read 35 years ago, it's available still on Amazon, From Simon to Peter. It's well worth it. Or if you don't buy the book, at least go through the Gospels and trace all of the stories of Simon Peter and how he grew from a proud, cocky, uh, foul-mouthed fisherman to an apostle, a servant of Jesus Christ, a fellow elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ. And it'll just thrill your soul. I remember as a teenager, a brand new Christian, our pastor was doing a series on Sunday nights for a number of weeks on Simon Peter. And I, and I kept thinking, how does he know all about me? How does Pastor Bob Lively know all about me? He knows all of, all of my failures. But he wasn't preaching to me. He was preaching to the whole congregation, but I, I could identify so much with Peter and Peter's failures and, and Peter's regret of his failures and his determined to, to press on to maturity that I said, despite my failures, as a, even as a Christian, I want to press on. I want to grow. I want to develop. So that's a wonderful study for you and I to do. I've been doing it lately, and it just thrills my soul to... to uh, look at the life of Peter and, and, and see his progression, growing and developing and maturing. Well, Peter warns in the passage that Noel read of some things that uh, are going to be stolen away. Uh, the day of the Lord will come like a thief. And Jesus reminds uh, his disciples of that very thing in his teaching on the, the, what was, the, in his day, the future destruction of the temple in Jerusalem, but also of his second coming. And he says, he warns, on that day of the Lord, one sh shall be taken and the other left. 
Two men will be grinding or, 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 or out in the field working. One shall be taken and one shall be left. Two women will be grinding at the mill. One shall be taken and one shall be left. There's going to be a separation. Not everybody's going to be ready for that day when Christ returns. And we need to be ready because all that people outside of Christ treasure and, and build up and amass as their great affection and their greatest treasure, in one day it's going to be taken away. And Jesus warns, he says, it's like the owner of the house. If he knew the time the thief was coming, he would not let his house be broken into. So be ready so that the thief doesn't steal away what you value. And what do you value? Do you value a faith that is more precious than gold? Do you value an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or waste away? Or do we value these things of this life that are going to be taken away from us one way or another? May we treasure what the thief can never take away, that genuine faith, that precious inheritance that is ours as believers, and uh, I look forward, looking forward to the new heaven and the new earth where righteousness dwells. Charles Wesley, the evangelist and traveling preacher in the early 1700s in New England, was once accosted by a, a thief while Charles Wesley was on his horse near London, England. And the thief said, stop, your money or your life. You can imagine how disappointed the thief was when Charles Wesley gave him all his money and it was hardly anything. He, all he had was a whole bunch of Christian books on the saddles of his horse. And the thief went, went away muttering because he had such little money from his theft. But Charles Wesley said to him, you stop, I have something to tell you. And the thief turned around He's, and, and Charles Wesley said, you might some day turn away from this kind of life as a thief. And if you do, remember this. The blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son, can cleanse you from all sin. A number of years later, after a Sunday evening service when John Wesley was preaching, uh, a, a, a well-dressed businessman came up to him and said, I was that thief years ago, and I want to thank you for all that you've done. I've, I'm a Christian now, and I'm a successful businessman, and I want to give you the, the thanks and John Wesley said to him, no, don't thank me. Thank Jesus, whose blood has cleansed you from all your sin. And uh, the Lord can take the thief and turn his life around. Well, we're going to look at three words that begin with G as we seek to uh, be uh, victorious over the thief who has come to steal and kill and destroy. First, first G word is ground. Ground yourself in the Savior's work of grace and in the promises of the Scriptures and the power of Christ. Ground yourself in the Savior's work of grace and the promises of the Scriptures. Go back to chapter 1, verse 1 of, Simon, of 2 Peter. Simon Peter, a servant and apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who through the righteousness of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ. But no, notice those two words are describing Jesus Christ. So there, right there you have a, a verse that testifies of the deity of Christ. To those who, the, who through the righteousness of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ, have received a faith as precious as ours. Grace and peace be yours in abundance through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. Notice how... Peter's message begins with the word grace, and it ends in chapter 3, verse 18, with grace. But grow in the grace of our, of our Lord Jesus Christ. And it's through the righteousness of Christ by which we're saved. It's through the blood of Christ who gave himself once and for all for our sins. Christ bore our sins in his own body on the tree that we might die to sins and live for righteousness. 1 Peter 2, 24. Christ suffered once for all, the righteous on behalf of the unrighteous, to bring you to God, 1 Peter 3.18. But Peter summarizes uh, this salvation as uh, he's the Savior, 
and he's our righteousness. A righteousness that we could never earn through doing the best we can or our own works, but it's Christ clothing us with his righteousness, our sin exchanged for Christ's righteousness. That's the gospel. Grace and peace be yours. And Peter goes on to talk about this power of God and the promises of God. Verse 3. His divine power has given us everything we need for a godly life through our knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and goodness. Some people say, I could never live the life you live as a Christian. What should your answer be? I could never live it myself, but it's Christ that lives in me. Yet not I, but Christ that lives in me, as we were singing about. Verse 4, through these he has given us his very great and precious promises, so that through them you may participate in the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world caused by evil desires. Oh, to memorize the promises of God in his word and to meditate upon them. Jeremiah 31, 3, I have loved you with an everlasting love. Therefore, with the cords of loving kindness, I have drawn you. Philippians 1, 6, being confident of this very thing, that he who began a good work in you will be faithful to carry it on to completion until the day of Jesus Christ. Hebrews 13, 5, I will never leave you or forsake you. 1 John 4, 4, greater is he who is in you, the Spirit of God, than he who is in the world, Satan. Jude 24, now unto him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you faultless before his presence without fault and with great joy. To the only wise God be glory and honor forever and ever. Amen. Ground yourself like a tree with deep roots so that you know that you're not like the chaff which Satan sometimes will say, that's what you are. You're chaff. When trouble and persecution comes, you're like the chaff that's not pure grain. You're just going to be blowing away with every wind of doctrine and every temptation that I put on you. But no, I'm grounded with Christ as my solid foundation. The hymn is wonderful how firm a foundation you saints of the Lord is laid for your faith in his excellent word. Well, the second G is guard yourself from the influence of seducers and scoffers. Throughout the whole chapter 2 of 2 Peter and the first part of chapter 3, you have lots of scoffers and seducers trying to bombard you. And we need to guard ourselves and recognize Satan is a father of lies and he's come to steal and kill and destroy you. So be on your guard. Chapter 3, verse 17. Therefore, dear friends, since you have been forewarned, be on your guard so that you may not be carried away by the error of the lawless and fall from your secure position. As a Christian who's saved, do you have a secure position? Yes. But nevertheless, Peter says, be on your guard. Don't just be a, an empty professor of these things, but make your calling and election sure by giving all diligence. And we'll get to that in a moment. But, but notice this in chapter 2, verse 1. There were also false prophets among the people, as there will be false teachers among you. They will secretly introduce destructive heresies, even denying the sovereign Lord who bought them, bringing swift destruction on themselves. Now Peter goes on to describe these people. Uh, chapter 2, verse 14. They seduce the unstable. Chapter 2, verse 17. These people are springs without water giving a lot of promise, but the springs have no water. They, themselves, they promise them people freedom, but are slaves of depravity, chapter 2, verse 19. Notice chapter 3, verse 4, 4. In the last days, people will say, where is this promise of his coming? Everything continues as it has been since the since uh, forever and ever. And um, so pa Peter warns about uh, people that deny a, a couple things at least. 
They deny that God in the beginning created the world out of nothing and the waters were separated and God said over the six days, let there be light. Let the waters be separated. They deny it. They say, and have you heard this? God isn't the creator. Millions of years of evolution, although the improbabilities are so remote, when you, when you think of millions and billions of years, all of a sudden, it all came together. Now, you go out and look at the beautiful day we enjoyed yesterday and today, and you say, well, who, who's the fool? Am I the fool who believed that God, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth? Well, the Bible says, who's the fool? The fool has said in his heart, there is no God. The other thing they're ignorant and, and, and deny is the worldwide flood where only eight people were saved. Now, I, know, I know some professing Christians think it was a local flood, but as I look at Scripture, uh, I think it's very clear from Peter. He mentions it more than once. Eight people were saved. And I, I know that uh, even people in China have uh, a history that there was a flood in Noah's day and eight people were saved. And so uh, there's even some of their figure, figures of their written language that indicate some of these things that is a study in itself, an amazing study in itself. But there's a worldwide flood, and things didn't just continue on uh, uninterrupted. There was a judgment. When Noah entered that door, the door was shut, and everybody else other than the seven others, they perished in the flood. And Peter's warning, there's a day coming when all of this Present earth is going to be burned up with fire. The elements will melt with a fervent heat. And there's going to be a new heaven and a new earth. And we need to not cling to uh, these things of this present earth. So we need to guard ourselves from the influence of seducers and scoffers. Have you ever been seduced or have you ever been lied to or cheated? Anybody? I know I have. Back in 1992, I think it was, there was a Disney movie, Aladdin, and there was a song, well, a number of songs, but Aladdin and Jasmine are on this magic carpet, and they're flying through the sky, and they're singing a whole new world, a new fantastic point of view. No one to tell us no or where to go. Now I'm in a whole new world with you. Our, our children were young at the time, and my, our daughters were singing it at the top of their lungs. And I said to them one day, is that true? And they didn't like it because they were enjoying the song so much. They didn't like me. And I said, don't ever be seduced by that thought and those words that th this wonderful world is where no, no parent is ever going to tell me what to do, and I can do what I want, and, and, and you can be in a whole new world where nobody's going to tell you what to do, and you can be uh, the master of your own uh, choices, and everything as a result will be perfect. And I'm glad to say, uh, although they didn't like my lecture at the, at the time, uh, I, I believe by God's grace, God kept them through the prayers of God's people and our efforts to try to train them in the love of, of the Lord. Skip ahead 30 years, May 2022. It had been a hard day. I'd been under a lot of pressure. My computer went all haywire. But set on the screen, phoned this Microsoft helper, this expert, and he will guide you through the steps to solve your computer problems. My, my daughters know how 
ignorant I am about computers. So they had warned me as an elderly adult, Dad, never give your information on your computer to a stranger. You don't know what you're doing. But this man was friendly. He was kind. He was very patient. He even had said, hold on, I'll get even a higher supervisor to help us with this. It might take some time. Have a drink of water. And it'll take time, but we're going to help you solve this problem. An hour later, I began to get suspicious. And then I suddenly realized $3,000 had been taken out of my bank account. I raced to the bank and canceled all my information so that there would be no further thefts. And I was seduced. I was tricked. I was lied to. I was deceived. And you'd think, with the warnings that my daughters had given me and my maturity, I would have been not deceived. But it was a lesson to me that we need to be on our guard all the days of our lives, no matter how many decades we've been a Christian, be on our guard. Don't be deceived. Don't be tricked. Don't be lied to. Be diligent and be discerning. I'm thankful that uh, I have a praying church. Uh, uh, Shortly afterwards, I went to the Tuesday night prayer meeting, and I said, could you pray for me? I've been I've been, I've been deceived on the computer. I lost some money. And people were praying for me, and I appreciate the prayers. But I, I'm reminded of, of this verse, John 16, 22, where Jesus said, Now is your time of grief, but I will see you again, and you will rejoice, and no one will take away your joy. No one will take away your joy. I will see you again. And maybe sometimes you're, you're like Peter after you denied Jesus, and you're like me after I, I really blew it. And, and you feel so defeated and so stupid. And you're living in re- regret with your head down low. But, but don't let Satan rob you of your joy. Get back up. Confess your sins. He's faithful and just to forgive you of your sins. Purify you from all unrighteousness. Keep your eyes on Jesus and and keep going for the gold, because you can still leave a legacy of, of, of wonderful treasure for God, uh, as, as Peter did. Because his, fa- his failures did not have to be final, and, and my failures don't have to be final either. The third G is grow. Go to the end of chapter 3. And we'll read verses 17 right to the end of the book. Therefore, dear friends, since you have been forewarned, be on your guard so that you may not be carried away by the error of the lawless and fall from your secure position, but grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. To him be glory both now and forever. Amen. So that's the bottom line. Am I, am I shrinking back or am I growing? Am I maturing? Peter three times uses this word, this phrase that's in the NIV, make every effort. The word means be very eager with all earnestness and diligence. 2 Peter 1.5, make every effort to add to your faith goodness and to goodness knowledge and to knowledge self-control and to self-control perseverance and to perseverance godliness and to godliness mutual affection and to Mutual affection, love. For if these qualities are in you, they will keep you from being ineffective and unproductive in your knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. But he who lacks these things is blind and nearsighted and has forgotten that he has been purged from these former sins. So chapter 1, verse 10 reminds us again, make every effort to confirm your calling and election. For if you do these things, you will never stumble, and you will receive a rich welcome into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Do you just want to be saved by the skin of your teeth like Lot, 
who was a, a righteous man, but distressed by the filthy conversation of the wicked. Uh, Peter warns about that kind of life in chapter 2, about Lot. He also warns about Balaam, who had a lot of gift of prophecy, but he loved money more. Don't be like Lot. Don't be like Balaam. Be growing. Make every effort. And then finally in chapter 3, verse 14, make every effort to be found spotless, blameless, and at peace with him. So shortly after Peter wrote this, he was taken to the gallows. He didn't want to be crucified upright like Jesus had been. He didn't feel worthy. Crucify me upside down. And church historians testify that he was crucified upside down. Skip ahead 40 years. Pliny the Younger was governing under Trajan, the Roman emperor, and he was in charge of these regions where Peter and his wife had ministered for many decades. And he wrote this, It is incredible with what devotion these poor people support and defend their cause. They are firmly persuaded that one day they will enjoy eternal life, therefore they despise death with wonderful courage. They look with contempt on all earthly treasures and hold everything in common." What a testimony. These are non-Christians speaking of their admiration for Christians that Peter had and his wife had influenced uh, 40 years before and, and the decades before. And the challenge as I thought of this was this. Christ could return at any time. I could die at any time. But wouldn't it be wonderful if, if Christ delays his coming for 40 years and there's still people here, young ones, who are now still living 40 years from now, that would be the kind of life that they're still shining forth in this Long Branch community for the glory of God. May it be so for, for Christ's glory. To that end, Lord, we commit ourselves. Uh, we thank you for a wonderful salvation that Jesus has purchased. We thank you that your promises are sure and we, but we know that your warnings are sure, and we just pray that we might be like Peter, that when we fail, we would not give up, but we would repent and get back in the race and finish well for your glory. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.